Good morning. So I'm Neil and one of the pastors here, and I'm glad to be with you in worshiping today. And as we move into uh, this time in the Word, I want to do so guided by Psalm 34 and just just mention that we as a church are, are grieving as Amy Mosier Madison went to be with the Lord this past Monday night. And we want to be thinking of Chad and her son Drake and his new wife Lauren as well as her son Kyle, Lexi, Lauren, and Megan. Uh, Amy pursued the Lord with great faith over these last couple of years, trusting in his power. And the beauty of the moment is that what she believed and had faith in is now sight. And so that's great hope for her in the midst of our sadness for her family and for us. Let's, let's pray as we begin our time in the Word. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angels of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Heavenly Father, we, we come this morning because we know that we are in need of your goodness. Um, we know that goodness is found ultimately in you, and we trust that you give us goodness from your word. And so as we gather to lift up your name in song and, and be shaped by your word being taught, we pray, Lord, that, that through the Spirit you would nourish us and you would satisfy us, and, and we would find hope in the message we hear this morning. We pray all this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. So if you were with us last week, you remember that we, we looked at one of the more challenging passages in the New Testament. When the author of Hebrews, we're in Hebrews 6, um, if you'd want to turn there, we're going to be in verses 13 to 20 today. But last week, we looked at the author of Hebrews' warning when he describes a person who has either come to the Lord or, at the very least, has drawn very near to the Lord. And yet, in falling away, in verse 6, it says, It's impossible, then, having fallen away, to restore them again to repentance. And, and he goes on to encourage the audience, to encourage us, and remind us that God sees. And ultimately, the point of his warning, the point of the passage is this. Cling to Jesus. We desire, verse 11, each one of you to show the same earnestness and to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Cling to Jesus. Make him the object of your faith and your hope. But this brings up a really important question in my mind. A question that some of you may ask when you are encouraged to cling to Jesus. How do we know that doing what we're invited to do in verse 12, imitating those who through faith and patience inherit the promises, how do we know it is worth imitating the faith and patience of those referenced in verse 12? Last week, one of the examples I used was, was, was the idea of investing. In the future, and, and, and our present actions demonstrate our future hope. And so, my question is how do we know our investment of faith is worth it? Now, not all investments are equal. We, we understand this, right? Not all investments are equal. Hypothetically speaking, how many of you, and, and I want you to raise hands here, how many of you would be impressed if I told you that my wife and I? put 40% of our current income into a retirement account. Hypothetically, we don't really do that. How many would be impressed if that were true? That'd be amazing. Now, keep those hands up for a minute. How many would still be impressed if I told you the, entirement, or the entirety of our investment retirement accounts was Dogecoin? A few less impressed, maybe? Not all investments are equal. And here's a question I would have you consider throughout the morning. Think about the choices that you're making each and every day. Maybe you're wrestling with choices right now as you sit here this morning. Things that you need to decide, things you need to do, or maybe you've recently made choices. And a question I would have you consider about the choices you make is, what investment is this choice asking me to make? Where is this choice or decision 
offering me or, or offering for me to place my trust? What am I hoping in? And think about the upcoming election season. How many of us, and, and again, from either side of the aisle, will say something like, the future is at stake with this election. And so invest, choose us. That's the message you're going to hear again and again this season. And after the author of Hebrews so boldly warned us and sternly warned us last week, I would say that the passage this morning tells us this, that the security of our investment of faith is ultimately rooted in the character and commitment of God. The security of our, the investment of our faith is ultimately rooted in the character and commitment of God. And, and in order to understand the passage, we need to do some review. And so before we read the passage, I need again this week at least one volunteer. Maybe I have space for a couple. And, and again, I know we have some extra people in the room this morning, some of our uh, fifth grade and unders who aren't normally with us. And if you would be willing to help me out, would you just raise your hand? Because I need a couple of you, maybe just one. Any volunteers? All right, I got one over there. Come on up, Isaac. And Tim, will you do it? All right, come on, my man. You know, honestly, um, Isaac and Tim are only willing to volunteer because they're curious as to why, how I'm going to use some of the props. But guys, I, I have a question, and I'm going to, Isaac, I'm going to ask you this. When you think of old, what age do you think of as old? 80. 80. So 80. You think 80 is old. That's, that's fair for now. Um, maybe some would disagree. But Isaac, now I'm going to ask you to do something really tough. I need you to go out there, and I need you to find a person who might fit into that category <laughs> and get them to come up, because I need help. So, so you go work on that for a minute. And, and if you would, as Isaac is working, listen, and, and Tim, you, you will have work to do in a minute, don't worry. Listen to God's word to us from Hebrews chapter 6. <laughs> this is why I asked Isaac to do this. So yeah. All right, we need one volunteer. All right, so... Listen up to God's word to us from the author of Hebrews. Starting in verse 11, we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So the security of our investment, of our faith, is rooted in the character and commitment of our God. And the author of Hebrews, after saying, imitate those who by patience and faith inherited the promises, he reminds us of one of the most significant characters in all of the Bible. In fact, it's this character's faith that becomes the faith that we are each invited to emulate in turning to and trusting fully in Christ. He reminds us of the story of Abraham. And you may not have caught it in hearing Hebrews chapter 6 this morning, but he's pointing us to a very particular instance in Abraham's story that we're going to review this morning. If you would, keep your finger in Hebrews chapter 6, we'll come back, but flip all the way back to early in your Bible, Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22 is the story of Abraham when God asks Abraham to do something rather incredible. Carol, thank you so much for being willing to come up and be a volunteer. Come, come on up. We need, you. we need you up here because you are going to represent that character. And ironically enough, Isaac, you are going to play Isaac. 
So you know the story of Abraham. Abraham, at 75 years old, God says, you are going to have many descendants. And I'm going to take you to a land that is not yours, where you have never lived, and I'm going to make that land your own. And through your many descendants, Abraham, or Abram at the time, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Well, fast forward in Abraham's life. He did not have the son of that promise until he was 100 years old. His wife, Sarah, was 90. And where we find ourselves in the story today, I would guess Abraham is somewhere between the ages of 106 to 112 on up. And we know this because when God says to Abraham, Abraham, I want, to take your, I want you to take Isaac, your son, to Moriah, which is Jerusalem, and I want you to sacrifice him on a mount I will show you. And so it says that Isaac and Abraham took a three-day journey to get there. And when they get to this Mount Moriah where God shows Abraham, he leaves the donkey and his servants there. And Abraham gives the wood to Isaac. And Isaac carries the very wood on which he is meant to be sacrificed up this mountain. Now, now think about what this would have been like. Abraham is very old at this point, 106 to 112. I'm only guessing that because Isaac was old enough to carry the wood. And Abraham is taking every step towards fulfilling the command to take this son of the promise life. Now, at one point on the way up, you guys may know the story, but Isaac says, Dad, Abraham? And ironically enough, Abraham says, here I am. He says that three times. Once when he's called to sacrifice Isaac and once coming up in the story. But, but Isaac says, Abraham, father, and he says, here I am. Where's the sacrifice? And he says, God will provide. So then he gets to this mountain. Isaac has carried the wood. And then he does this. And I, I didn't think about this until I was reading the story this week. He has to build the altar. Now, Carol, good news. You don't have to use stones today. But I do have a couple of chairs over here that I would love for you to use to set up an altar for us right here. I'll get this out of the way. Well, you'll get it in a minute, don't worry. So think about what it would have been like to have taken this journey and now be setting up the very place where you're going to be sacrificing your son. Imagine the agony that this would have been for Abraham and maybe for Carol this morning. <laughs> Carol, thanks so much for being willing to do this. And so he builds the altar. It says he binds his son and his son lays on the altar. Hmm. Well, it's got to go under you, I would assume. All right. And then it says... Abraham takes the sword or the, the knife with which he's meant to sacrifice Isaac. You can go ahead and grab it, Carol. It's right behind you. And somewhere in the process of preparing to sacrifice his son, a messenger of the Lord speaks. And Tim, read that first part for us. It's in red. Just the red. So Abraham demonstrates his faith by laying on the altar the son God had promised to him at his old age, trusting that God would provide. And you know how this story goes. They turn and look, and there's a goat or a sheep, a ram. And so God provides a sacrifice. So Isaac comes off the altar, and they're able to sacrifice a ram on the altar. And Abraham names this mount, God will provide. But Tim, read for us, the next thing that this messenger of the Lord says, which pertains to our passage in Hebrews today. Yeah. By myself, I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this, and I will not withhold your son, your only son. I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and as the sand, as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring, your offspring shall be. Possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of 
By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, I will bless you and multiply you, and in your offspring all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So think about this story, and we'll come back to it in a minute. But Abraham put the wood on his son, carried him to the place where he would be sacrificed, and demonstrated his trust by, willing to, by being willing to give up his very hope of a future. Think about that for just a minute. And thank you guys. I've got a little something to say thank you for Isaac. For, oops, sorry, Isaac. For being Isaac, which in one sense was really easy. But in another sense, I know what I asked you to do was tough. And Tim, thanks, bud, for doing that. And so Abraham is asked at this very old age to sacrifice the son of the promise. And, and in the midst of this, as the author of Hebrews calls us back to it in chapter 6, he points out some very significant things about who God demonstrates himself to be. So we said that security of the investment of our faith is rooted in the character and commitment of our God. And it is those two things that God puts on display in Genesis chapter 22 when he makes his promise to Abraham. First, I want us to consider the value of God's character. The value of God's character. Verse 13 again says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves. You see, the, God based his commitment to Abraham on the quality and the value of his character. He binds his very self to the promise he makes. And there is a, there's a couple of expressions here. There's an expression of worth. Since there was no one greater by whom he could swear, he swore by himself. Here's an interesting question that I would have us consider as we think about this. And this is something we understand. I mean, you've heard an expression where someone, I don't know that I've ever actually heard this in real life. I feel like you hear it in movies. I, I swear in my mother's grave. You know, just last week I was watching a movie with Robert De Niro and Leonardo DiCaprio. And at one point in the movie, Leo's character says, I swear in my kids. And De Niro's like, don't you dare do that. Don't you do that. But what's the idea of that? I'm promising based on something that is of great value to me. And in one sense, if I don't keep my promise, I'm offering this to you. A question I would have us consider then is what other foundations are worthy of the investment of your life? What other things would you build your life upon? You see, the source of this pledge that God makes to Abraham, that the author of Hebrews is pointing to us, is there's nothing more valuable, nothing of greater worth for God to swear by, and so he offers himself. It's an expression of worth, but it's also an expression of source. You see, God is of greatest value, but he is also of greatest strength. You see, he will not cease to be God, and so he will not cease to keep his word. So it's about who God is. He's of greatest worth, and it's about what God is capable of. He can be trusted. Trusting in him is secure. Now, we again understand the idea of entrusting yourself to something, looking for value and security to something, but the problem is too often we place that trust, we put that security, something in or in something other than what is of greatest worth and greatest strength. What are some of the things that that might be? How many of us put that kind of trust and security in our careers, in the jobs we do? I can remember in one of the groups I'm a part of, it's a mixture of guys who are retired, guys who are younger, and at one point, one of them talked about the fact that one of the hardest things for them when they got to the age of retirement was to step away from their career and realize the next day, everything went on just like it had before. And here you had placed so much value on what you had done, all that you had accomplished, and when you stepped away, it just kept right on sailing. 
And, and that took adjustment for this individual. That's understandable. What about devoting our lives and, and looking for security in the friends around us? That can be a really easy thing to do. It's something that as a youth pastor, as I look back at my own life, was really evident when I was young. And it's really evident so often in the lives of young people. But I'm not sure we can just say that only young people do it. We live or die based on the acceptance of the people around us. <gasps> Everything, the world can be great when our friends laugh at a joke. And some of the most uncomfortable moments in a young person's life are when their friends ask them to do something they're uncomfortable with, and they don't know how to say no because they don't want to disappoint their friends. I can remember moments like that in my own life, and I've seen young people wrestle with that same problem. What about family? Some of us put so much stress, security, hope in the idea of a spouse. Someday when we're married, and what if, what if that doesn't happen? What about when we get married and we put all of that security and hope in a spouse? Or, or we have kids and we put all of our security and hope in the lives of our kids. Now, again, career, friends, things that we may have, spouses, kids, all good things, right? But they are not able to bear the burden of all of our hope. They are not able to be the source of our security. If we do that to them, it will create a mess. It will create a mess. But we do this in the life of the church as well. The church can communicate, you should but trust in yourself, in your works, in your efforts. Do these certain things and you're good to go. Sometimes churches ask you to put that sort of trust and security in a leader. That's one of the ideas or, or words you heard a lot in, in the age in which we can go online and listen to pastors thousands of miles away from us. And, and you'd start to hear this term rise up, leader worship, that, or, or, or famous, uh, the celebrity pastor. And so you can build a, a cult of trust around trusting a leader when really that trust is not meant to be put on what you do or don't do. It's not meant to be put ultimately on a leader. Ultimately, good leaders point the heart of your trust, the eyes of your heart to God and encourage you to trust him. You see, the Bible invites us to know the greatness of God. There is no one greater by whom he could swear. It also invites us to know the goodness of God. That's what we heard in Psalm 34 this morning. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is worthy of your trust. But the Lord is also strong when he promises Abraham, and he says, by myself, I swear that I will bless you and I will multiply you. He was good for his word. You know, in fact, at, at the end of Deuteronomy, Moses is telling the story of how God chooses Israel and takes Israel for himself. But he says at one point, Israel is going to get, he says, Jeshurun grew fat and lazy. And it says that, he, that Israel would look to other gods and they would worship gods that were not gods. And, and then at one point in this poem, Deuteronomy 32, he says, I almost would have destroyed you, but here's the problem. If I did that, the other nations would get the wrong idea about who I am. And so I will redeem you for my sake so that the nations will understand not how wonderful you are, Israel, but how wonderful and holy I am. Then as Ezekiel 36, Ezekiel picks up on that same theme. And God says, I'm concerned for the holiness of my name. And so Israel, though, though you are far from me, though you are in captivity, I will redeem you so that the nations will know the holiness of my name. God keeps his word to demonstrate the power of his name. But here's an important point for us to consider. The more we know God, the more we will be able to have uh, the rest of our hope upon him and the firm foundation of our confidence in him so one of the implications of God basing his promises to Abraham and to us on himself, his character, is the more we know of his character, the greater it will enable us to trust him. 
But here's the good news. There are some of you who are in the midst of a storm. And you're wondering, is a problem that I didn't know God enough? Here's God's promise, is that he will also show us himself more fully in the midst of our desperation, so that in the midst of trials and struggles, we might find assurance of his promises. I mean, for example, think about the book of Hebrews, or the sermon of Hebrews, whatever it was. The author is writing to a group of people who are struggling, and they're considering giving up on their faith. And what does the author do? He reminds them of the greatness of their hope in Christ. So study. Study who God is. So that you can trust in who he reveals himself to be. But here's another encouragement. We, we understand who God is not only in study, but we also solidify our trust in him through worship. So not only do we study to know who God is so that we have a firm foundation in which to trust, but we also cultivate a heart for worship, both individually but corporately as well. Corporately as well. So that when we gather here to worship and we lift up the name of Jesus and celebrate the goodness and the love of God, we are reminding ourselves that our hope is in him. And incidentally, brother or sister who sits here today and sometimes will make a comment like or think like, I get so much more out of the things I do than what happens in here in a corporate gathering on Sunday. Here's the danger of that. What happens in here in a corporate gathering on Sunday is where we remind ourselves and affirm ourselves in the foundation that is ours. Our hope is not in our effort. Our hope is in him and who he is. But knowing God and worshiping him have to go together because we have to know who he is so we can appropriately worship and trust him. We trust him for the promises that he has made to us, for the character that it is his, not who we want him to be. So one of the implications of the value of God's character is the more we know of his character, the greater we will understand the foundation of our hope. So he demonstrates that the security of the investment of our faith, verse 11 and 12, is in the character and commitment of God, 13 to 20. We've talked about the value of God's character. Let's think about the value of God's commitment. And I want to think about it by asking a couple of questions. Now, these are questions that, that you may have asked of people at, at some point in time. Let me uh, throw out one scenario for you. Let's say you've got a dear friend, and they're thinking of renting an apartment or a space they have to another dear friend, or they're thinking of selling that friend, uh, another dear friend, a car. Wouldn't you sometimes think to say, make sure you get it in writing? So don't just kind of talk, shake hands, and say it'll be all good. Write things down. Make it clear. And, and here's why I ask of that. There's a sense in which the author of Hebrews in this passage, in a way that is a little invisible to us, the English readers, is a part of the point he's making is we have God's promise in writing. You see, verses 13 to 17 are chock full of language that comes from the legal world in the, the Hebrew and Greek world. So when you see in verses 13 and following the word oath, for when God made a promise to Abraham, he, he, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore it by himself, saying, surely I'll bless you, multiply you. For, for people swear by something greater than themselves, picking up in 16, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. And, and when we, we see that word swear in verses 13, and we see that word oath in verses 16, those are legal terms. When he talks about in a dispute between two people, an oath makes the final decision or confirmation. The word dispute, that's a legal term. There's ways that he uses conjunctions and nouns that, that would have sounded like a legal contract. That's what it would have called to mind. The word confirmation in verse 16 is another term that the readers would have read, and to them it would have shouted out legal, contract. Covenant. The word unchangeable, verse 17. You see, what the author is telling us is God, 
beyond what we could imagine or ask, has bound himself, he has obligated himself to us. We understand this because there are words that we use from in our everyday life that, that, that speak of or carry with them legal weight. When we talk about contracts, when we, we say something is nullified, we talk about stipulations, trials, restitution, verdicts, liabilities, purchase agreements, rental agreements, all of those are legal things. And we use them to, to create a sense of or a vision of or an understanding of formality to what we're doing. And, and the author of Hebrews is doing that for us. It's as if he's saying God makes promises, and not only does he say them and base them on his character, but he enters into covenants with us. He really, in a sense, lowers himself and binds himself to us in a way that we could understand so that we might have security. Now, so you might ask somebody who's thinking of of renting something or selling something, hey, did you get it in writing? Now, there's another question that, that from time to time you may have asked somebody. Um, they may come to you and, and they may talk about a deal that they're thinking about getting into or somebody has approached them about. Um, and, and alarms may go off in your head and you may think, that does not sound good. And then you may say something like, did you sign anything? What have you committed yourself to? You see, when we think about the idea of an oath, we're talking here about covenant. We're talking here about accepting obligation, which is something God does for Abraham and for us who look to him in faith. And the obligation that God makes, it's not dependent on Abraham, right? Going back to Genesis 22, by myself, I have sworn, I have made a covenant. His obligation is not dependent on us. It's it's based out of who he is. His obligation is costly. His obligation is not exhaustible. We cannot reach the end of God's agreement to us. And now let's go back to this for just a minute. Abraham. He puts the wood on his son's shoulder. He walks him up this mountain that is in or around what is Jerusalem. And his son is meant to be the sacrifice. And God says, no, Abraham, you've demonstrated your faith. I will provide the sacrifice. And he does. Not ultimately in a ram, but in his son who carries his cross up that hill near Jerusalem, who gives up his life on that cross for us. You see, God shows his willingness to demonstrate his character and and the strength of his commitment ultimately in history by sending his son to pay the penalty for our sins. And Jesus demonstrated his faithfulness by being obedient to that. And we understand this when we think of something like adoption. Think of adoption for a minute. Now, if I have three incredible kids... And you guys, most of you, many of you know them. Um, if I one day decided I'm done with these three, I, I've done enough, they're on their own. Would anyone in this room come and talk to me about that? We get that having children creates an obligation. Now, have you ever gotten angry at someone for not adopting? But think about what adoption does. Adoption is a willing decision to take on the obligation, the the costliness, the, 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 the inexhaustible nature of what it is to be a parent. They didn't have that child, but they have said, this child will be mine. And you know that that decision can't be made based on the child. There's going to be days where they love you, and there's going to be days where they don't. And you can't base parenthood on their decisions, right? They're yours. You know that adoption is going to be costly. Even if everything goes according to the dream, they're healthy, they do well in school, they go on and get a job, all those things, that's still costly. But when you take on an adoption, you're bearing the weight no matter what will come. And it's inexhaustible. Adoption doesn't come with a point where we get to say, oh, I'm done. And that's why that's such an incredible picture that God uses in the New Testament 
to demonstrate how he's going to love us as his children. So the security of the investment of our faith is rooted in the character, who God is, but also his commitment, his willingness to bind us to himself. And the question I would have is, what does that mean ultimately then for us? What does that ultimately mean for us? And this is where we've talked last week briefly, this week a little bit more, about the idea of investment. But this is really a bad image. It's not really perfect. Because ultimately, unlike the idea of an investment, what the author of Hebrews is talking about here is a situation in which we bring nothing to the table. Now, just imagine for a minute, I showed up in Cupertino, California, Cupertino, California, where, where Apple has its headquarters, and I said, hey, guys, I want a piece of the pie. I want some stock in Apple. They'd say, great, here's what the current shares go for, buy as much as you'd want. I'd say, no, 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 I don't want to pay for it, I just want it. Well, maybe they have careers where if I worked, I could get shares as a part of my payment. And I said, no, 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 I don't want to work for it, I just want it. Investments don't work if we have nothing to invest. But listen to what the author of Hebrews says after saying that God didn't have anything greater to swear by, so he swore by himself. And God, when he wanted to assure us of his promise, he made an oath, he made a covenant, a pledge to us. So that with these two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to our hope. We who have fled for refuge. Do you know that you come to God as a refugee? Do you know that's how you come to him? You have nothing to bring to him. You need everything to come from him. Think about modern images of a refugee. When, when we had the group that was here from Afghanistan, think about the images you saw on television of them literally running after planes as they left the ground. That was a really dangerous situation. Those people were desperate. One of the soldiers I met here who was an Afghan national, he was serving with the U.S. Army as an interpreter. The story of his life included spending a significant amount of time, years or months at least, at a refugee camp outside of Afghanistan before he ultimately was able to come to the, Amer to the United States and then serve in the Army. Think about images you've probably seen over time of people. You saw a lot of them in the Mediterranean. People dangerously overcrowding a boat, packed in, little tiny boats trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea to get into Europe because they were desperate to go from where they were to where they thought they'd find hope. Think about this fact. There are people in our country right now who are literally enslaving themselves to someone else just to have a chance to be here. That's the idea of a refugee. I have nothing. I'm leaving everything. Because if I want hope, I've got to go there. Imagine being so desperate for something that you would put yourself in that boat that's way too small for all the people. That you would be willing to enslave yourself to people that you probably know you can't trust. That you would live in a camp with nothing hoping every day you can go to that spot they tell you to and there will be food and water for you. People who have followed Jesus for a long time, who sit here today with years and years of trusting in him, do you remember that you are a refugee and you owe everything to the God that you've run to? We who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to our hope. You see, I forget that truth at times, especially when I work with people who are struggling, who are going through hardship. It's easy to forget that I too am a refugee. I too am in need of everything. But the good news is God is a refuge for us who come to him, desperate and with nothing. We can trust in his character. We can trust in his promise. Not only is a refuge for us who come to him desperate and with nothing, he is also an anchor for us who are tossed about by powers that are greater than us. He goes from saying that those who have fled to him as refugees might have strong encouragement to hold fast the hope that is set before us, to then say, we have this as an assured and steadfast anchor of the soul. Now, you know the value of a good anchor. 
I can think of days where it was perfectly beautiful out, and I would go out with my kids to fish in our canoe, and we would start in one spot, and it would be a pretty good spot, but the next thing I know, I look, and we've moved like 50 feet away because we had no anchor. One time I went out to Walmart, I bought an anchor, I tied it up to my canoe, I dropped it in the boat, we fished for a while, I looked up, and again, we drifted like 50 feet away. I still had the rope, but I hadn't tied the anchor well. <laughs> we, we know the value of an anchor when we do things like fishing, but I, I saw for a while on Facebook, I was seeing these videos of guys kicking the chains on the anchors on big giant boats. I mean, have you ever seen those videos? The chains are massive. If they would get caught in them, it would kill them. Imagine how big those anchors must be to get those big heavy chains to move that fast. And then think of this. Imagine the immensity of God as an anchor and his ability to hold you steady in the midst of the storm. You know, we may not realize it all of the time, but there's moments in our lives that help us realize that we really can't do it all, that we really do need help. And we can look to God's character. We can look to the security of his promise to us. And we can have hope. But the author of Hebrews gives us a few other bits of information about that hope. He is an anchor. He is a refuge for us who are refugees. And our hope leads us to unhindered intimacy with God. Verse 19, again, this sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner places beyond the curtain. This is talking about the holies of holies the place where God's throne was said to be so that he would come and sit and meet with the people of Israel. But only once a year could someone go in there. And only after following all of the ritual sacrifices for themselves as the high priest and for the people of Israel, then they tied a rope to him to make sure that if God struck him down, they could drag out the body. And what he's saying is our hope takes us to there. Our hope draws us to the very throne of God. We do not have hope at a distance. We have a hope that takes us into intimacy with him. But it's not only that it takes us to intimacy with him, but we know that our hope is based on one who has gone before us. Where Jesus has gone, verse 20, as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You see, the author is taking us back to where we're going to be going as we get into Hebrews 7 later in July. But he's telling us that our hope leads us to an unhindered intimacy with God and our hope is secured by an advocate who has gone ahead and pleads on our behalf. He is a forerunner. Jesus has run the race that the author of Hebrews is inviting us to run so that we know how it was done. And we know that not only is Jesus having run the race, seated with the Father, but he is there advocating for you. He is there speaking on your behalf. He is there representing you. And so as we're encouraged by the author of Hebrews to remember God's character, to remember the strength of his promise, he says this, God's character, God's promise, is worthy of our hope who come to him with nothing. And we can look to Jesus who has gone before us in this race. You see, ultimately, the choices you make every day demonstrate where you're placing your hope for tomorrow. This is not a uniquely Christian truth. That's just true. You are hoping in something. You're trusting something to be true on which you base the things you do today. That's just how you live. And a question I, again, would have you consider is, is what you're trusting in, the story that you're believing about how the world works, is it big enough, is it firm enough to hold up under the weight of your trust? Can that thing, can that idea support what you're trying to lay on it? You see, when we consider the character of God, when we consider the assurances he has given us in his word, when you think about how he has demonstrated his power in the person and work of Jesus, why would you invest faith anywhere else? Let's close in prayer. Jesus, we thank you for what you have done on our behalf. We understand that it is a demonstration in your death and in your resurrec resurrection that we can trust in you. And the authors of Hebrews, after warning us and after pleading with us to continue to hold fast to the hope that is ours in you. Thank you for this picture of the character of the God in whom we are hoping. And my prayer is that for those who are struggling with hope today, 
that they would be encouraged by the truth, God, of the greatness of who you are, but also the assuredness of your promise and your, your obligation to us. And so my prayer is simply that they would believe, that they would rest in their faith in you. I'm going to pray all this, Jesus, in your name.